Welcome to HPF at Home. We are so honored that you have joined with us today, gathering with us online as our folks gather on campus this week to worship Christ together. We're gathering to encourage one another, and we sure need encouragement, and to influence one another, to be who God wants us to be. Now, today, if you are a guest or if you're just one of our folks at home, make sure that you drop your name over to the side. Maybe wave and tell everybody that you're glad to be here. We want to know who you are, and we want to know that you're watching and that we're ministering to you through this very broadcast. So make sure you do that. And then, if you would, share this broadcast on your social media, and you can hashtag that, HPF Online Sunday. That allows other people to see what God's doing at Harvest Point. It's a great way to invite people to church that's nearly painless. You might hurt your finger. I don't know. Hey, today we've been studying in our Bible study class led by Tom Renew and through the Gospel Project. We're now already in the book of Romans. We study through the entire scripture in three years and we're nearing the end of that cycle. And today we were in the first part of Romans and what the gospel is and how good the God, how good God is to give us the gospel. So that's at 830 on Sunday mornings through Zoom. You don't even have to leave your home. It's a great way for you to connect with other people. It's live. And if you don't know how to do that Zoom class, I would love to show you how. And it's very simple. If you can do this, you can do Zoom. And that way you can participate with what God is doing and how He's teaching us. The discussion and even the fellowship is such a strength, and I believe it would minister to you. So if you're not involved in that, I'd like to help get you involved in that. Would you message me this week, and we'll solve the problems that you have of getting online with our Zoom Bible study class. Also, it is January. That means that 2020, thank the Lord, has come to an end. But you may be getting ready to do all of your taxes and you may need a giving statement. Now you can access that through Church Center uh, and print that off for your tax records. But if you have problems with that, we need you to message the address at the bottom of the screen, Tina at harvestpointfellowship.org, or you can give her a call, and she will help you uh, as our financial secretary. She's been inputting and working all that together. She will help you to be able to get that record printed off, and if you can't do it, she will do it for you. So make sure that you do that because that time is coming up very soon. Again, we're so grateful for your presence today that you have decided to worship with us. And we pray that today you will draw nearer to Jesus because of the time that you spend worshiping Him. Hey, happy Sunday. Let's worship.
feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you we'll see you break down every wall we'll watch the giants fall for fear cannot survive when we praise you the god of breakthroughs on our side forever lift you high is found today in Hebrews chapter 8 verses 6 through 13. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry inasmuch as he is also a mediator of a better covenant which was established on better promises. For if a first covenant had been faultless then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they did not continue in my covenant, and I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor, none of his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their uprightness and their sins and their lawlessness deeds, I'll remember no more. In that, he says, a new covenant. He has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Our prayer time today is a great time to gather your family with you where you're watching so that we can pray together here on campus and also there where you are. We want to pray about several things today. Of course, those in our congregation of Harvest Point Fellowship that have some health needs. We want to continue to pray for the Gastons, for Lee, especially as he gains uh, strength with his battle over MG. We want to pray for the Curseys. Miss Judy's husband, Herman, is at the VA hospital, and he's struggling with several different things, pneumonia, other issues that are going on, and it's such a stressful time for them. Please remember uh, Mr. Herman and Miss Judy. And for Charlene Crank, we want to continue to pray for her and the healing of her knee um, and getting her back to where she needs to be and where she wants to be. Also for Brahim Hurani, we want to pray for him. He's had sinus surgery in this past week and has had some issues that we want to make sure that he heals up very, uh, very well. And for Allie Thomas, she's had some health issues also. Uh, with a high fever. So we want to pray for those young people within our congregation. And then we want to continue to pray for Gail Griner. Uh, it's been a long journey with her for COVID, and she uh, has been in ICU on a vent, and we've they brought her down off of dependency of that vent a bit, and we want to continue to pray for that and pray for Steve as he uh, is unable to be with her, but we want to pray especially for Gail. Within our country, this week has been a momentous week uh, with the inauguration and other issues that have happened. And we want to pray for God to use this time in the life of our country to draw people into Himself. 
Some trust in chariots, some trust in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God, where our hope is. We want to pray for our country. Uh, these are tumultuous days, and we want to pray that we would be the people God wants us to be. Also today is what we uh, call a Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. We don't, um, we don't mention it as much uh, week to week, but it's the 48th anniversary of the Supreme Court decision in the U.S. of Roe v. Wade that made abortion uh, legal in our nation. And since 1973, there have been 62 million babies that have been aborted. That's 62 million lives. And since 1973, that's pushing nigh on to uh, 50 years of people, not only for those babies, for the babies that those babies would have had. Who knows what would have been in the lives of those children as they had grown. Not much younger than I am, so that's a lot of living to do. We want to pray for those, um, uh, for those situations of those families that are still scarred by those uh, events of those abortions. And we want to pray for those women who, for some reason, did that but do you know that the grace of God even reaches to that? Maybe you've had an abortion and you feel that it is an unforgivable offense, although it's very serious. There's nothing that is beyond the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus, our Messiah. And we want to be able to give that message to those women and to those men who have experienced that sadness in their life. And we want to pray that that would be halted and would be stopped in this nation and around our world. Speaking of babies in our missionary area, we want to pray for the Greens, uh, Ryan and Amy Green, uh, that are serving in Thailand, right, uh, working and serving there. They just uh, welcomed a new baby girl, Ellie this week. So we want to continue to pray for them. And then today, we want to pray for the Praetors. The Praetors are serving in Europe, and they are working with European um, uh, Christians that are there, Jewish Christians that are in Poland that have connected with them, and they want to spread the gospel among them. Poland has less than 1% evangelical population, which makes them an unreached people group. So 75 years after the Holocaust and after World War II, uh, the Jewish population is now growing. So they want to be able to help to reach those Jews that are there in Poland for Christ. So we pray for Ben and Christy Prater. Their names are uh, changed, of course, uh, to protect their identities, but we pray for them still the same. So as we, as we are praying today, I encourage you to gather with us and let's pray. Thank you, Father, that you have called us into the Holy of Holies, and we can boldly come to your throne of grace, asking you to do great things on our behalf. Lord, today we lift all these things to you, and we ask that you would work in them as only you can. God, we know that you are the answer 
and that you have provided your son Jesus for the salvation of the world. Lord, help us to look to you by faith and boldly proclaim the truth of your word. Lord, in every one of these situations, we speak the truth of your word over them. Lord, we sing your song and we ask for you to minister your grace and your goodness, your healing, your comfort, and your peace to us as we seek you. Lord, thank you for working among us. Thank you for calling us to work among people that they may see your light in each one of us. Lord, we pray that for our families. We pray that for our church, for this nation, and for this world that we live in. Lord, until the day you call us home, I pray that we would sing your song and we would draw near to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Today we're going to continue our series, Dwell, Tabernacle in the Wilderness, God Among His People. God desires to be among us. And we've progressed as the priests have been out in the uh, outer courtyard as they have come in, and we've been going on our journey, and we've finally reached the inside of the Holy of Holies today with number 12, and that is the Ark of the Covenant. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 25 today. Now, we study this because it's very important because it reveals to us God's redemptive plan, not only for Israel, but for all man mankind. The tabernacle is just simply a graphic portrayal of God's redemptive program for all of us. And every single aspect of it points to Jesus, the Messiah. It foreshadows the fullness of the redeeming relationship that we may have with Him. And the more familiar we are with the tabernacle, the more we're going to understand Jesus, our Savior. And all that His life means to us, I think that's what we need the most today. I believe that it's one of the most encouraging things that I have studied to know that the truth of Scripture is sure and secure. Now, we've moved inside that tent of meeting and, uh, and into the tabernacle proper out after we were in the courtyard with the altar and the, and the labor and all of that that was out there. And if you haven't heard all of those messages, I encourage you to go back on our video page on Facebook or on YouTube, and you can watch those on demand. It's very easy, and uh, they're all there pretty much in order. So it would help fill in some of those spots to help you understand a little more. So if you have missed one, go back and watch that. Now, we know that as you entered into that tabernacle where the priests would be able to go, the left side was the golden lampstand, on the right side was the bread of presence, and right in front of the veil of holiness was the altar of incense. But inside that thick, thick veil that uh, separated with darkness is the Ark of the Covenant. Now, this whole tabernacle was a copy of the heavenly tabernacle, so it was patterned very specifically after what God had given to Moses. Now, if you look at these details, the purpose and the symbolism, we're going to see why God gave that pattern so specifically and how it affects us today and what it means. Our first point, surprise, is going to be the details of the Ark of the Covenant. We've followed each one of those specifically so that it breaks it down with historical information, but also it helps us to understand where we're going to go. The details of the Ark of the Covenant are found in Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 through 16. Let's read those together. And they shall make an ark of acacia wood. Two and a half cubits shall be its length, a cubit and a half its width, and a cubit and a half its height. 
and you shall overlay it with pure gold inside and out you shall overlay it and shall make on it a molding of gold all around you shall cast four rings of gold for it and put them in its four corners two rings shall be on one side and two rings on the other side and you shall make poles of acacia wood and overlay them with gold you shall put the poles into the rings of the sides of the ark that the ark may be carried by them the poles shall be in the rings of the ark they shall not be taken from it and you shall put into the ark the testimony which I will give you. Now, we've been walking with the priests as we, as we have entered chronologically, not in the order of the Scripture's chapters, so that's why we've been jumping around a little bit here and there. Uh, but we should note that the first item that God told Moses to build was the Ark of the Covenant. Now, I know we've studied all of the others, and we're almost at the end of our study, and we're finishing up with, with these last little bit, but it was the very first item that Moses was told to make. It was the centerpiece, the single most important detail, because it was the model of God's throne in the heavenlies. Wayne Barber says, Man builds a house, and then he thinks of the furniture, but not so with God. The Bible makes mention of the ark 180 times, thereby emphasizing its significance. The ark of the covenant is none other than the throne of God. Now, there were some specific details of instruction that were given to Moses about how it was to be made. It was to be crafted of acacia wood, but it was to be overlaid with gold on the inside and the outside. Isn't that like Jesus? And we're going we're gonna to discuss that a little bit later. Now, the ark was not very large. It was only two and a half cubits long by one and a half cubits wide and one and a half cubits high. So that was about three and three quarters of a foot long by two and one quarter of a foot wide and two and one quarter of a foot high. So it was kind of like a little, a little box, a little rectangular box that would have been there. Not, not large by any means. And it stood behind, uh, it was placed behind the veil of holiness that we studied just a couple weeks ago. Um, and I won't go into all of that went through that because we don't really have time today. We have a lot to cover. But go back, and if you missed that, go back two weeks ago and see uh, about the veil of holiness because it ties in so well. Now, it also had a molding of gold all around it, kind of a crown molding, like the altar of incense and some of the other uh, pieces of furniture. And underneath that molding were four golden rings. Now, uh, at Christmas time, we sing about five golden rings. This is only four. And the priests were to carry the Ark of the Covenant with gold-covered acacia poles whenever the camp moved. And those poles, unlike some of the poles for other uh, articles of the uh, furniture in the tabernacle, were never to be removed. It was, it was maybe most holy. It was extra holy uh, and never to be touched. Now in Exodus chapter 30, and we covered this a little last week, Moses was told to make a special recipe of anointing oil. And it was to be used to anoint anoint the ark, as well as the entire tabernacle complex, um, and Aaron and his sons as the priests. It was a consecration of holiness. So this ark was a holy vessel. It was set apart for a special purpose. Now God would also instruct them to place certain items into the ark, because remember it was a, it was a box. And we're going to see what those were and what their purpose was in just a little bit. Now, sitting on top of the ark, uh, sitting on top of this box, is something called the mercy seat. And the mercy seat is where the glory of God rested. Now, we're not going to cover the mercy seat this week. We're going to save that for next week. And I promise you, I've already done some research on that, and it is uh, such a great thing to be able to study. So that will be next week, Lord willing. So that's the details of the Ark of the Covenant. Now, our second point today, the purpose of the Ark of the Covenant. What is the real purpose? Throughout the Bible, we see how important 
The ark was to God's holiness. It was a symbol of His holiness, and that was a great purpose for it. Now, everyone remembers, hopefully, the movie uh, that uh, star, uh, was about Indiana Jones. It was a 1980s movie with Harrison Ford called Raiders of the Lost Ark. Now, it was fictional completely, I promise. It was all fictional. But it was the idea of Hitler trying to discover where the Ark of the Covenant was located in order that he would gain the powers of the Ark so that he would be able to win the war. Now, at the end of the movie, and I'm, here's some spoilers. If you don't want to hear it and you haven't ever seen it, you just mute us for just a moment. But at the end of the movie, the ark was too powerful to be controlled or used for selfish purposes. Now, this was long before a lot of uh, uh, computer-generated uh, stuff happened in movies, but I remember the flesh just kind of falling off of those creatures, uh, those people. Uh, and it was sort of terrifying, but it showed the power of this ark. Remember, that was entirely fictional. But 1 Samuel chapter 4 through 7, the first verse of chapter 7, shows that the Philistines did the same thing after they defeated Israel at Shiloh. Remember, the, uh, the Israelites thought that they could win the battle just by taking the ark, and God hadn't told them to do that. Well, then the Philistines won the battle, and they took that ark. Why did they take it? Because they recognized God's power and they thought His power could be possessed by them. But God doesn't perform like a genie in a lamp. God didn't work like that then, and He doesn't work like that now. So God struck them with tumors, and they returned the ark to Israel. Now, if you want to read some really interesting stuff, you didn't know that golden hemorrhoids were in the Bible, did you? I remember hearing a message on that many years ago, uh, and it struck me as, as humorous, but that's what God struck them with, and they made golden idols out of these uh, hemorrhoids that looked like that, and they sent the ark back on an ox cart led by two milk cows. It's true. They wanted to get rid of that thing because it was causing them such problems. And then we're also told a fascinating story of Uzzah in 1 Chronicles chapter 13, starting in verse 9, and also in 2 Samuel chapter 6. I'd like to read that because I think it's important for us to understand. Now, this moves past the period of the tabernacle into uh, the period where David was the king. And this is right after the ark had been captured at Shiloh and had been stored for a long, a long while, and David was going to bring the ark back to where they were. David again gathered all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000, and David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal, Judah, to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart, and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were driving the new cart with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. And David and all the house of Israel were celebrating before the Lord with songs and lyres and harps and tambourines and castanets and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen stumbled. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him down there because of his error, and he died there beside the ark of God. And David was angry because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah. And that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of the Lord that day, and he said, How can the ark of the Lord come to me? So David was not willing to take the ark of the Lord into the city of David, but David took it aside to the house of Obed-Edom the Gittite. Now, there's just lots of issues here. Well, first of all, the ark was never to have been put upon a cart. We just read that scripture. It was to be carried upon those gold-covered acacia poles on the shoulders of the priests. And that would have been the Levitical tribe and specifically the family of Kohath. 
that was the, the Kohathites uh, of the Levitical tribe. So it wasn't just any priest that could even carry that. It was very specific. You know, now the ark had been stored at the, at the house of Uzzah's father, Abinadab. Do you think maybe that Uzzah had been around that ark so much that he had gotten quite familiar with it and, and the things of holiness had become quite casual to him? He was way too familiar with holy things. There wasn't a reverence and an awe. Now when this oxen stumbled, Uzzah thought that he needed to take things into his own hands and that God needed him to steady it. What was his presumption? Well, his presumption was without his help, God's presence would be dealt a blow and would fall to the ground. He thought that God needed his help to do what only God could do. God had specifically said, you shall not touch this. And is, is it just because that was a rule? No, it was because it was a way of understanding the holiness of God. Have we done what Uzzah has done? Have we become casual with holy things? Have we tried to help God in our own way and made such a mess out of it? Well, believers should listen carefully to what God has to say in His Word and seek to do things His way if they're His things. You know, some would say, how could a God who loves people, how could He do this? God is love, but God is also holy. And He will not sacrifice one attribute at the cost of another. And violations of His holiness sometimes bring about His wrath. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 31 says, It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We can't just treat God any old way. And the tabernacle has shown us that immensely. God's glory cannot be touched by sinful man. No matter how innocent we are. Some have said Uzzah was just, he was just trying to, it was a, it was a muscle reflex. He was just trying to, to help out. He didn't want things to fall. It was casual. That's exactly right. The things of God, the things of holiness are never casual. They must be intentional. This preserves the sense of God's holiness and the fear of drawing near to Him in an unworthy manner. Why is that important? Because if we can come before God however, whenever, why ever, without any standard, then God isn't God at all. But with the Holy Spirit living in us, that changes everything. Without the Holy Spirit living in us, the terror of God's holiness would consume us all. So we find that the power of the ark was not in the ark of the covenant itself though. You say, well, Uzzah touched it, yes, but it was the presence of God that was violated. The power wasn't in that ark made of acacia wood covered with gold. That only represented the presence of God's people. Or the presence of God with His people. You know, Paul, the apostle, says in his famous message at Mars Hill, he reminded us of this truth in Acts chapter 17. He says this, God who made the world and everything in it, since He is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is He worshipped with men's hands as though He needed anything, since He gives to all life, breath, and all things. This God, this ark... It represented His presence among the people. He didn't dwell in that ark. It was a representation and His presence emanated all around it. That's the purpose of this great ark. The third point today and our final point, the symbolism of the Ark of the Covenant. Things are very symbolic throughout the tabernacle complex and we want to we make sure that we understand that here. The Ark of the Covenant is also called the Ark of the Testimony. You'll see that in many different translations. Yours may say that also. But it recalls the fact that the Ark, this box, would house God's testimony to His people, His standard, His law. God had made a conditional covenant with the children of Israel through Moses, the prophet. And He promised good to His children and to their children for generations and generations, if and only if they obeyed Him 
and kept the precepts of his law, his standard. He warned them, though, of despair and punishment if they disobeyed him. Remember, we even talked with Abraham. Obedience brings blessing. So as a sign of this covenant that, they, that God made with them, he had the Israelites make a box in which to place the stone tablets that contained the Ten Commandments. So the Ten Commandments were actually in the ark. And there were two other things that were in the ark, and we're going to look at those. First of all, though, the Ten Commandments were actually placed in the Ark of the Covenant. These were, these were the stone tablets that Moses had. And the Ten Commandments were not only a verbal telling of the law, a verbal standard, but they were written in stone by the finger of God given to Moses on the mountain so that there would be no excuse for their disobedience. If Moses had just said, this is what God has said, we, we see all throughout Scripture that people take that kind of lightly, don't they? But these were written in stone by the finger of God, giving, giving them no excuse for their disobedience. And don't forget, this is the second set of tablets because Moses threw the first set down and crushed them and broke them when they were worshiping the golden calf as he came down off of that mountain. Now these words were to be their life. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 47 tells us that these words were to be their life and as a witness against them when they disobeyed his precepts. They were his testament of holiness. And later on it even tells us in Deuteronomy that all of those uh, Levitical truths and all of the laws that were there, not only the Ten Commandments but the other things that were the testimony and standard of God were written down by Moses and they were there a along with the Ark of the Covenant, though we don't know that they were ever placed on the inside. Some think that they were, but they were still there around in that area. Now, what did this symbolize? This symbolized that Jesus lived a perfect life. He kept the law. He kept the Ten Commandments. He was perfect and spotless. Why? Because He was Messiah who came to fulfill the law. In fact, in Matthew chapter 2, 5 verse 17, it says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now we also have in the Ark of the Covenant, manna. Sometime later this was added and scripture tells us why. Exodus chapter 16 verse 34. 2 through 34 says, Then Moses said, This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Fill an omer with it to be kept for your generations, that they may see the bread with which I have fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Moses said to Aaron, Take a pot and put an omer of manna in it and lay it before the Lord, lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, so Aaron laid it up before the testimony to be kept. Now, this is provision. It's provision that was sufficient and that was satisfying and that was sustaining. Jesus, the Messiah, is the bread of life. Our provision that is sufficient. Now, the living word... Jesus the Christ is satisfying and He is sustaining. He is the one who is the manna from heaven. John chapter 6 verse 32 through 35 says this, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is, is He who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. So we had the Ten Commandments, and we had the, uh, the golden pot of manna. And then we also have in the Ark of the Covenant the staff or the rod of Aaron. Now after the rebellion of Korah, 
in the wilderness. And you need to read that story if you don't know what that is. We don't have time to go into it right now, but it's a great story, uh, a great true story. God commanded each tribe of Israel to bring a staff or the rod with the leader's name inscribed upon it. Now the tribe of Levi's rod had Aaron's name and Aaron brought that. And they were placed in the tabernacle overnight. And the next morning, Aaron's rod, out of all of the twelve, Aaron's rod not only sprouted, but had budded, blossomed, and produced almonds. That's recorded in Numbers chapter 17. And that showed God's blessing upon the line of the Levitical priesthood. By the way, this is the same rod, Aaron's rod, Aaron's staff, it was the same rod that God turned into a serpent before Pharaoh in Egypt. Isn't that amazing that that would be in there? Now, Jesus, as our great high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek, is superior to what was instituted under the old covenant. And Hebrews chapter 7 tells us that. His is a royal and ruling great high priesthood, which is perfect which is changeless, which is uh, composed of one individual who has always existed and always will. Now, instead of a priest interceding, coming and, and praying in that Holy of Holies once a year within that earthly tabernacle or even later the earthly temple, Christ intercedes constantly before God's throne. Now, the covenant that is mediated by the order of Melchizedek is better with better promises than the Old Covenant. And this shows us that Jesus is that great high priest. He is the resurrection and the life. Hebrews chapter 9 verses 11 through 12 says, But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect, perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with His own blood. He entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. So we see that the Ten Commandments, and we also see that the manna, and then the staff, and the rod of Aaron were there, and they symbolized and all pointed to Jesus the Christ. But the ark itself symbolizes the place of God's presence, and that is found fully in Jesus the Messiah. He was God in human form, the second person of the Trinity. He is the Word become flesh. Now this ark was made out of acacia wood. Acacia wood is such a, such a hard, virtually indestructible wood. And it grows in spite of the desolation of where they were there in the wilderness. And it grows with branches that are filled with thorns. It symbolized that Messiah was God in natural human form. And He took the very form of a simple, humble servant. That wood was covered with gold on the inside of that box and on the outside, different than anything else of, uh, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle complex. And it symbolized that the Messiah was truly God, was regal, was divine in nature. He was royal. He was in gold, and that was inside and outside. There was nothing hidden. It was all gold. So where does that leave us when we look at the purpose and the symbolism of the Ark of the Covenant? And I can't wait to share with you next week about the mercy seat because it really completes out what we've studied today. So where is the Ark? Where's the Ark today? You know, there's many interesting theories, and if you chase them on the Internet, eh, you, will, you will have a lot of entertainment in some ways. Uh, in, interesting theories. There was a, a copper scroll that was found at the caves at Qumran, and, and they actually might be a record that is referred to in the uh, extra-biblical book of Maccabees, which described that the prophet Jeremiah hid the ark. Maybe. It's also rumored to be buried under the hill of Tara in Ireland. It uh, most famously is said to be housed at St. Mary of Zion's church in Ethiopia, guarded by generational priests who give their life to guard this. No one's ever seen it, supposedly other than that one guy who guards it. 
It, it has been said, and this is one of the most interesting to me to read this, uh, that it's buried under Mount Calvary, under Golgotha, in a cave way below. And uh, it's very interesting to read that. Or uh, some man has said that he has seen it on Mount Pisgah near Mount Nebo. Uh, some have said that it is hidden away in an ancient Egyptian temple in an Israelite settlement. Some have said that it's even hidden beneath Jerusalem's Temple Mount in catacombs and tunnels that are all down there. But alas, the ark remains lost to all but God. It has yet to be found. But does it really matter? Remember, the power of the ark uh, of the covenant was not in the ark itself. It only represented the presence of God with His people. Now, because of Christ Jesus, the power of God resides in every believer through His Holy Spirit. We are now the temple of His presence. We are now the ark of His covenant. Christ has made a way because He is the way. Do you know Him? Is He living by His Spirit inside of you? He's calling you right now. He's calling all of us to come unto Him. I believe that today, if you hear His voice, don't harden your heart to Him. Come to Him by faith, and He will save you by His grace, and you will become a temple of His Holy Spirit. Now, this tabernacle was just a giant, extremely specific arrow that points unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the real reason for the tabernacle's existence. He tabernacled among us so that we might dwell with Him. And God desires to be in fellowship with you. The ark of His testimony is for you. This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my day.
lost without you. I'm lost without you. I'm lost without you. sense and the holy of holies the presence of the king it's inviting us to come in today if christ is moving in your life and you've never responded to him help let us help you take that step would you message message us at the address at the bottom of the screen i'd love to be able to talk with you this week about taking another step in christ's love thank you so much for joining us today as we've been worshiping gathering influencing one another encouraging one another and i pray that you are encouraged today make sure you join us back here on our social media channels and uh, facebook and youtube so that we'll be able to worship together covid19 has made it aware the church can't be together all as one but as you worship with us online it's the next best thing to being in this room and we look forward to the day when we all can be together to worship our king maybe it'll be with him eternally in the holy of holies in the heavenlies before even COVID-19 gets through wouldn't that be amazing to breathe in celestial air that's my prayer and I hope that it is yours also I pray you have a great week and I pray that God blesses you this week as you seek him happy Sunday Good morning, Harvest Point brothers and sisters. Today's uh, benediction is Psalms 121, verses 7 through 8. The Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. The Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Mm -hmm.